the life of our father among the saints, Basil the Great, Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia. And everyone who knows how to pronounce those names correctly is wincing right now. I apologize. Basil, preeminent among hierarchs, wisest of saintly teachers and wondrous favorite of God, was born in Cappadocia toward the end of the great Constantine's reign. His father was also named Basil and his mother Amelia. He learned to read at the age of seven and progressed so rapidly in his studies that five years later he was already engaged in philosophical inquiry. Eventually, he forsook his homeland and moved to Athens, the fount of Hellenic wisdom, Hellenic mean, meaning Greek, the fount of Hellenic wisdom, where he took lessons with the renowned teacher Ebulus, at the same time visiting the schools of Humerius and Proeresius. Basil soon, soon equaled, then surpassed his teachers, who were amazed at his diligence and intelligence, and still more at his modesty and purity. In Athens, Basil became friends with Gregory the Theologian, later Bishop of Nazianzus, and for a time, Patriarch of Constantinople. And he also became friends with Julian, future Emperor of Greece and Rome, and apostate from God, and with the Sophist Libanius. Between Basil and Gregory, a warm and unbreakable bond of love was formed, for both were meek, chaste, and upright. So close did they become that they seemed to share a single soul. The wondrous Basil devoted much effort to attaining an understanding of divine mysteries, to the point of neglecting to eat while he resolved whatever question was troubling him. Having dedicated himself for 15 years to mastering Greek learning, the saint concluded his studies with investigations into astronomy, but no secular knowledge sufficed to quench his thirst for the waters of true wisdom. One night, while he was meditating on the only wise creator and true God, a divine ray penetrated his heart kindling in him a fiery longing to comprehend the scriptures on the most profound level. Leaving Athens and his friend Gregory, who had become a teacher of rhetoric, Basil went to Egypt. There, in the possession of a certain Archimandrite Porphyrius, he found a large collection of theological writings, which he spent a year perusing. While so doing, he nourished himself solely on vegetables and drank nothing but water. During this time, he significantly deepened his understanding of the true faith. Then Basil obtained Porphyrius's blessing to visit Jerusalem and view the holy places and other, and other wonderful sites of Palestine. At length, he returned to Athens, where he disputed with various Greek philosophers, guided numerous Hellenes to God, the Hellenes is in Greeks, and showed them the path to salvation. Desiring out of gratitude to convert his former teacher, Ebulus, Basil searched for him in the schools and finally found him outside the city, conversing with other philosophers. And in brackets it says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. After listening to the disputation briefly, Basil resolved the issue, but without revealing his identity. Who is this unknown philosopher? The sophist asked one another. He is either some god or Basil, replied, replied Ebulus. Recognizing Basil, the teacher dismissed his friends and disciples. For three days, the two learned men, occupied with philosophical discussions, ate nothing. Among other things, Ebulus asked Basil, what is the essence of philosophy? The essence of philosophy, Basil answered, is the remembrance of death. He pointed out the in insubstantiality of the world and its pleasures which at first seemed sweet, but afterwards become extremely bitter to the man enslaved to them. But besides these consolations, explained Basil, there are others of a heavenly origin. It is impossible to enjoy both, since no man can serve two masters. Our duty is to break the bread of understanding with those whose discernment is faulty, and to lead to the shelter of good works those unprotected by the roof of moral excellence, taking pity on their nakedness, for they share the same nature with us. Basil then related an allegory intended to convey to Ebulus a sense of the Saviour's mercy and love for mankind. Imagine three plaques hung near the door of the mind, he said. One is fastened over the doorway and depicts personifications of bravery, wisdom, righteousness, and continence. To the left of the door is a second panel with spiritual deception in the middle, 
surrounded by gluttony, fornication, drunkenness, immodesty, sloth, contentiousness, garrulity, obsequiousness, and many other vices. To the right, repentance is portrayed, dignified and smiling benignly, putting to flight her adversaries and consoling her friends. Near her are abstinence, chastity, propriety, compassion, and the whole assembly of virtues. These guide us to, these guide us to salvation in very truth, O Ebulus. We shall all rise from the dead and appear before Christ's judgment seat, some to inherit life everlasting, others to be condemned to eternal torment and shame. The prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and David assure us of this, as do the Apostle Paul and the Lord himself, who draws us to repentance and rewards us for our deeds. He searches out the lost sheep and accepts the prodigal son, embracing and kissing him lovingly, arraying him in splendid apparel, putting a ring on his finger, and holding a banquet for him. He gives equal recompense to those who come at the eleventh hour and those who endure the burden and heat of the day. Upon penitence born of water and the Spirit, he bestows things which eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, which God hath prepared for them that love him. At this, Ebulus exclaimed, O Basil, revealed by heaven, through you I have come to believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of all things. I await the, the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. As, a pr as proof of my faith, I surrender myself to your guidance. I wish to remain with you the rest of my life after being born of water and the Spirit. Basil replied, Blessed is God henceforth and forever. He has illumined your mind with the light of truth, O Ebulus, and brought you out of error to a knowledge of his love. Now since you desire to live with me, I shall explain what we should do to attain salvation and escape the snares of the present life. We shall sell all our possessions and give the money to the poor, thus acquiring boldness with God, then go to the holy city and see wondrous things. Without delay they disposed of their property, purchased white robes for themselves, such as are required for those wishing to receive divine baptism, and departed for Jerusalem. On the way they converted many to the true faith. Reaching Antioch, Basil and Ebulus entered an inn. At the door sat the proprietor's son, a youth named Philoxenus, who was deeply distressed because he was unable to fulfill his assignment of writing a paraphrase of Homer. Basil asked him, why so downcast, young man? Philoxenus asked, Why do you want to know? Basil did not take offence, but promised the boy that he would not regret explaining. Whereupon Philoxenus told the saint that he was a disciple of the sophist Libanius and was unable to perform the task he had been set. Examining the text, Basil translated it into the common tongue in three different ways. The youth was delighted and amazed. He begged Basil to write down all three versions. The next morning, Philoxenus gleefully presented them to his teacher, who was astonished and exclaimed, By divine providence, no, no scholar I know is capable of such renderings. Who wrote these, Philoxenus? The boy replied, A stranger staying in my home wrote them quickly and without the least difficulty. Libanius hurried to the inn and was extremely surprised and pleased to find Basil and Ebulus. He invited them to his house and set before them an elaborate meal. The guests, however, observing their usual rule of abstinence, touched nothing but a little bread and water, for which they gave thanks to God, the bestower of blessings. Libanius put to them various philosophical questions, but they responded with a discourse on Christian piety. I acknowledge the strength of your arguments, Libanius admitted, but I'm not ready at present to accept the doctrines you espouse. Nonetheless, if providence fosters the faith of Christ, who can resist it? But I tell you, Basil, I would be most grateful if you would expound your teaching to my pupils. Libanius quickly assembled his students. Basil advised them to acquire purity of soul, dispassion of body, meek deportment, serene speech, temperance in eating and drinking, silence in the presence of elders, attentiveness to the wise, obedience to rulers, and unfeigned love for one's peers and inferiors. He urged them to avoid evil things that stir up the passions and foster sensual pleasure, to speak less and to listen and investigate more, to maintain reserve, to avoid laughing, to acquire, to acquire modesty, to flee contact with loose women, to cast one's eyes down, 
to lift the soul up to heaven and to shun disputes. Basil told them as well not to seek the rank of teacher, nor to place any value on this world's honours, but to do good to others, hoping for everlasting recompense from God and Jesus Christ our Lord. The pupils gladly attended to Basil's discourse and were astonished by his wisdom. Basil and Ebulus resumed their journey and reached Jerusalem. Hearts burning with faith and love, they visited the holy places, at each one praying to God Most High. Finally, they presented themselves to Maximus, bishop of the city, and asked that, that he baptize them in the Jordan. Perceiving their sincerity, the bishop agreed. Accompanied by his clergy, he went to the Jordan with Basil and Ebulus. As they approached the bank, Basil fell to the ground and besought God with tears to show a sign to strengthen his faith. He was shaking with fear when he rose. Then putting off his clothing and, and with it the old man, he entered the water with prayer on his lips. The holy hierarch approached to immerse him, and suddenly lightning flashed. Out of it flew a dove, which plunged into the Jordan and stirred up the water, then returned to heaven. Those standing nearby trembled and glorified God. Basil emerged from the waters of sanctification, praising the Lord, and the astonished bishop clothed him in the robe of Christ's resurrection with the appropriate prayers. Maximus also baptized Abulus, chrismated both men, and imparted to them the divine mysteries. Basil and Ebulus returned to the holy city and remained there for one year. Afterwards, they went to Antioch, where Archbishop Miletius ordained Basil to the diaconate. In Antioch, Basil occupied himself with studying the scriptures. Before, before long, he departed for Cappadocia, his homeland, still accompanied by Ebulus. As they were nearing Caesarea, Leontius, archbishop of that city, had a dream in which he was told of their approach and that Basil would eventually inherit his see. The next morning, Leontius summoned his archdeacon and several esteemed clergymen, commanding them to go to the eastern gates of the city and bring him, bring him the two strangers they found there. Leontius was amazed when Basil and Ebulus were presented to him because they were the same men he saw in the dream. He glorified God and asked them their names and whence they had come. Thereupon he ordered the table set and summoned his clergy and the most eminent citizens. When everyone had assembled, he explained to them his dream. With one voice the clergy exclaimed, God has indicated your successor to you because of your virtuous life. Do with him as you think best. The Lord has clearly chosen him and he is worthy of all respect. After this, the archbishop took Basil and Ebulus aside and questioned them wishing to determine the extent of their knowledge of the scriptures. He was astounded by the depth of their wisdom, decided to keep them by his side, and thereafter treated them with particular respect. In Caesarea, Basil became a monk and imitated the manner of life he had observed while visiting the ascetics of Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia. He was also ordained presbyter by Hermogenes, who became archbishop after Leontius died, and he was appointed instructor of all the monks living in the diocese. When Hermogenes departed this world, the people wished to have the holy Basil as their prelate, remembering how he had been forechosen and considering him worthy of the episcopacy. But the saint, who disliked being held in high esteem, hid from them. Eusebius, a virtuous but poorly educated man, was consecrated instead. Seeing what respect was accorded the wise and holy Basil, and constantly hearing his praises, Eusebius was overcome by, by envy toward, towards God's favourite. The venerable Basil learned this, and not wishing to be the cause of jealousy, retired into the wilderness of Pontus. The affectionate letters he wrote Gregory the theologian convinced his good friend to join him there. They lived an angelic life together, and soon numerous monks had assembled at their retreat. Guided by the Holy Spirit, the saints compiled a rule for Conobites. The blessed Amelia, Basil's mother, who resided in a village across the river Iris, provided their food. She was already a widow and was devoting her remaining years to pleasing God. The time came when both Basil and Gregory had to leave the wilderness and serve the church, which was then troubled by heretics. Gregory's father, who was Bishop of Nazianzus and also named Gregory, was elderly and unable to fend off the wolves vigorously, so he, called, so he called his son home to assist him. 
Meanwhile, Eusebius, Archbishop, Archbishop of Caesarea, sent a letter to Basil asking the saints' help in protecting the church from the Arians and expressing hope for a reconciliation. Seeing the Holy Church in such straits and regarding her well-being as more important than the benefits of life in the wilderness, Basil abandoned his seclusion and returned to Caesarea. He laboured greatly there, defending orthodoxy by his preaching and writings. Before long, Archbishop Eusebius surrendered his soul into God's hands while resting in Basil's arms. The great Basil was elevated to the archiepiscopal throne and consecrated by numerous bishops, among whom was Gregory of Nazianzus, father of Gregory the Theologian. Though old and weak, Gregory commanded that he be taken to Caesarea, since he was determined to persuade Basil to be consecrated and prevent the Arians from capturing the sea. Basil governed the Church of Christ well and ordained his, his brother Peter to the priesthood. Peter assisted the saint considerably, and eventually Basil appointed him Bishop of Sebastia. At that time, their mother, the Blessed Amelia, departed to the Lord. She was more than 90 years old. Her children were known for their outstanding virtue, especially Basil and Peter, another son, Gregory Bishop of Nyssa, and her eldest daughter, Macrina. Several years passed, and the blessed Basil asked God to send down the grace of the Holy Spirit to enlighten his understanding and give him wisdom, so that he might offer the unbloody sacrifice using his own words. Until that time, the Greek-speaking Christians had celebrated the divine liturgy only in Hebrew. Basil prayed for seven days, then the Holy Spirit descended and he went into ecstasy. Coming to himself, he celebrated the, litur the liturgy daily for some time and prepared for the awesome task of writing the new, ver the new version of the sacred service. Finally, with prayer on his lips and his heart full of faith, the great hierarch began work. That night he returned to church, and while he was setting out bread and wine on the table of preparation, the Lord appeared to him with the apostles. Basil fell prostrate, but Christ raised him up and said, in accordance with your supplication, your mouth shall be filled with praise, and you will perform the service using your own words. The Lord shone with glory so bright that Basil, who was shaking with fear, could not endure to look upon him. When the vision ended, the saint took a scroll and wrote in Greek the following words, Let my mouth be filled with praise, that I may hymn thy glory. Then he began the service, the liturgy that came to be known by his name, with such prayers as, O Lord our God, who has fashioned us and brought us into this life, and the prayer at the elevation, attend, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, from thy holy habitation and from the throne of the glory of thy kingdom, and come thou to sanctify us, thou who art seated on high with the Father, yet invisibly remainest with us here. By thy mighty hand vouchsafe to bestow the holy things, by thy mighty hand vouchsafe to bestow the holy things which are for the holy upon us, and through us upon the people. Afterwards, Basil recorded these prayers and the others on the scroll. Ebulus and the clergy of higher rank saw a heavenly light illumining, illumining the sanctuary and the bishop as he offered the Eucharist, and radiant men clothed in white garments surround the great hierarch. Awestruck, they fell to the floor, weeping and glorifying God. About that time, Basil summoned a smith and had him fashion a golden dove to represent the one that appeared when Christ was baptized in the Jordan. The saint hung it over the holy table as a receptacle for reserving the divine mysteries. One day, while Basil was celebrating the liturgy, a Jew, wishing to see the offering of the holy mysteries, entered the church with the faithful disguised as a Christian. He saw Saint Basil holding an infant in his hands and cutting it into pieces. The Jew approached with the faithful and received holy communion from the hierarch. Looking into his hand, he saw flesh. Likewise, in the chalice, he saw blood. He hid a portion of the gifts and showed it to his wife when he returned home, relating everything he had witnessed. Convinced that the Christian mysteries were truly awesome and glorious, he went the next morning to the blessed Basil and asked to be baptised. The man of God gave thanks to the Lord and straightway cleansed in the font the Jew and his entire household. Once when the saint was walking down the street, a poor woman unexpectedly fell at his feet. A government official had extorted money from her, and believing that her oppressor greatly respected the Blessed One, she entreated Basil to intercede on her behalf. The Holy Bishop drew, drew up a letter which began, a certain, needy, a certain needy woman has informed me that my words have much weight with you. If this is so, 
prove it by showing her mercy. The woman took the letter to the official who sent the saint this reply. Holy Father, I would like to be lenient with the woman, but cannot. She must pay taxes like everyone else. Again, the saint wrote to him as follows. So be it if you truly wish to show compassion, but circumstances forbid you. If, however, it is possible for you to forbear and you refuse, know that God will reduce you to dire straits, thereby preventing you from multiplying your evil deeds. In a short time, the hierarch's warning was justified. The emperor heard that the official was tyrannizing the people, became very angry with him, and had him fettered until such time as he repaid everyone he had wronged. From, pis from prison, the downcast man sent word to St. Basil, begging him to have pity and entreat the ruler to overlook his offences. Basil, Basil appealed to the emperor on behalf of the transgressor, and in six days a decree and, and in six days a decree arrived freeing him. Upon release, the official hastened to thank the saint for his gracious assistance, and he restored twofold what he had taken from the poor woman. First off, uh, you might have noticed that Saint Basil was not baptized until after he had studied a long time uh, in Athens and he went to Jerusalem and he was baptized uh, in the Jordan as an adult. Uh, this is in the fourth century and St. Constantine also uh, did, did not um, receive baptism until his deathbed. So um, neither of them were baptized as infants. But nevertheless, even as a, well, he, I guess he wasn't even a catechumen at that point. He was an inquirer, I suppose, is what you'd call him. He's converting people. So um, that's a, a very interesting point. Now, obviously, for um, the reason we none of us know when our last day is going to be, the church has uh, instructed us to baptize people as soon as, as possible. Um, Inside, we do infant baptism now, but it, it, there's also a practice where adults get baptized uh, because who knows when, when God give, brings people to the church. It's also important to note that um, St. Basil, when asked, always interceded for the people who were asking, even when somebody who had, uh, had uh, basically ignored what he had instructed and got himself into trouble, that the, the the governor collecting the taxes from the poor widow. Father, you, you mentioned how St. Basil was, was baptized later in life. I, to me, it blew my mind that he, he did all of these things, these amazing things before going to Jerusalem. So um, his converting all of these people to the faith, like he, like he, like you were speaking about, but also like his aesthetical feats. I mean, he was, and he was even going into the deserts, into the, of Egypt and living with the desert fathers before his baptism. The thing to keep in mind is that the grace of God um, does give people power to do incredible things, even if they're not Christian, as long as they are seeking God. And while he may not have been baptized, um, the life does say that from his youth, he was seeking to know or to understand the true God and how to live a godly life. Um, his, his teacher, too. I mean, the man uh, was teaching morality and, um, and trying to live a good life. And then when St. Basil comes back after uh, having... Uh, studied the scriptures and uh, Christian life, even though he's not baptized. They have um, discussions for several days, I think it said. And uh, he, the, the teacher then wants to make, become St. Basil's disciple. But he doesn't want to be just a philosophical disciple. He wants to be a disciple in finding the angelic life. And I guess also, I mean, just thinking about it now, St. Amelia was St. Basil's mum. And like how many of St. Basil's brothers and sisters were saints? Something like five, five of them, St. Macrina, St. Peter, St. Gregory. Nafratius, 
And there's one other sister who also was a nun. So we read very early on about the relationship between St. Basil, Basil the Great and St. Gregory the Theologian, and it said that they, they became so close that they seemed to share a single soul. And maybe we would read that and be surprised that this is po it's possible for something to happen outside of the union of marriage. And I guess I want to hear what your, your thoughts are on this, Father. Well, don't we see the same thing uh, between, say, say Anthony and Paul, the, the uh, uh, ascetics in the, the Egyptian desert, and with other uh, saints, particularly uh, monastic saints, um, when one is uniting to Christ, becoming a, a true Christian disciple of God, then it's not surprising that uh, they will find like a like soul um, and struggle together and basically come into communion with each other through Christ. And maybe this is something which is very encouraging, especially f for our converts who are converting to orthodoxy later in life. And because there is no, obviously there is no need for, for you to forsake good relationships. This was obviously a very pure and a very good relationship, a tight bond of friendship. I think that St. Basil wanted to make his teacher um, to show Christ to his teacher, to bring his teacher to Christ, something that's missing in the lives of a lot of us that we may be members of the church, but we're not so hot on um, bringing people uh, to the church. Also, um, I was touched to hear again that um, he was baptized uh, a Christian in the Jordan River, which we've done, we've baptized people uh, in that same Jordan River. So that's uh, kind of a plus to the whole life. I was just thinking about that when, when you're reading it, that uh, I was remembering back to our going to that, I think probably in that very same spot uh, where Christ was baptized. I think that's probably where they were, were, doesn't specifically say it, but I think that's probably where they were baptizing. Sure it was. We also read that St. Basil, even as a catechumen or before baptism, but he, he had this habit of he didn't eat when he was trying to resolve troubling questions. And I'm wondering, Father Joseph, uh, if this is something we should try to imitate, and if so, how should we go about trying to imitate this? Well, I think... This is, happens naturally, um, and it's not even necessarily having to, anything to do with a religious study or a philosophical study or a moral study. Um, I have witnessed in my uh, secular work people working long hours and, and basically ignoring eating anything or drinking as they're trying to uh, work through a problem. Uh, especially an important problem that, that has some moment, that uh, that's what they're focused on. And I, I take it as an indication of the uh, single-minded purpose of um, St. Basil in his search for God. I, w I was thinking about, um, you know, fasting and focusing and so forth. Uh, just on the idea of people looking for excuses not to fast, um, just regular fasting for us these days is difficult for a lot of people. And I think it would help us in our pathetic little journeys that we're taking, just trying to get closer to God. Um, this is another reminder that fasting could help us focus more on God, just regular fasting. Matushka, you wouldn't believe it. Maybe Father Joseph had heard similar, but in those years of confessing people, I remember not one, but two um, people telling me, um, I can't fast. I said, why? I have high cholesterol. I said, well, the doctor will probably tell, tell you to eat foods that are exactly what you should be eating while you fast. Uh, no, I have high cholesterol. I mean, if you want an excuse, there's always one. St. Basil was a great ascetic, and he was performing these, these great ascetical feats. So someone might read this, but there's, there's 
pick any life of a saint and you read about their ascetical endeavors. And so what if someone's listening to this and they feel this desire within themselves to be a great ascetic as well? Um, maybe I want to ask this, direct this question to Despada because obviously his grace is a monastic. What should a person do if they have such a goal for themselves to be a great ascetic? How should they, how should they actually approach that Despada? Because you, you don't go from zero to a hundred just like that. Well, most of us don't. Certainly go slowly as we can see in the life of, uh, St. Dositheus that we read together here on, um, one of the sessions, but also at every turn of the road, uh, please receive a blessing um, from your spiritual father, whether he's a monastic or a priest in the world. It's the same thing. He'll be able to help you uh, not to go to extremes and to take um, everything step by step. Uh, we should remember the words of St. Sigliti uh, that um, none of the desert, that abbess, who, who said, above all the ascetical feats is humility. So have we struggled with being humble? Uh, that's the first and the highest uh, ascetical feat, I think. I'm remembering an account from, I think it's the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. I believe it was St. John the Short tells his elder, that he wants to go live like the angels. And the elder tells him, no, you're not ready for it. But he's insistent on it. So he goes out into the desert to live like the angels. And a few days later, he comes knocking on the door and uh, says, you know, let me in. And the elder says, who are you? And he says, well, I'm John. And he says, you can't be John. John has gone to live like the angels. And that was what brought him to repentance. Yes, there's... There was a similar story during the days of my elder Amarathus. Of course, he went very young and he lived very old. 101 uh, was the age he fell asleep in the Lord. At. He said during his days in um, the Cenobitic Monastery of Kutumosio on Mount Athos, um, there was this uh, kind of young, um, headstrong novice that wanted to go out and uh, go to the Mount Athos, the, the mountain itself, and fight with the devil. And the, his um, spiritual father kept telling him, no, 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 the abbot of the monastery, no, no, you don't want to do this. And uh, finally, he gets up and says, no, I'm leaving, I'm going. And he does meet the devil on the road. And he comes running back to the monastery, and actually they had already closed the gates, and the elder of the monastery, the abbot, had to order that the gates be opened. And he said, did you battle with the devil so quickly, my son? He said, yes, he appeared to me and scared me very much. And he said, well, what did he do to you? He went in my face. Uh, oh, that was it, huh? Yes. Uh, why don't you just stay in the monastery and do what the fathers are doing? And um, that might be pleasing to God. So I, I had another thought about um, St. Basil's liturgy. It gives the account. It, but he, what the life says was that up until that time, they were celebrating the liturgy in Hebrew, uh, which I, I believe that would have been the liturgy of St. James. Uh, and it would have been written in Hebrew. And this is what three, four hundred years um, afterward. Um, and I just remember all kinds of people coming to me and talking about, well, you know, it's in Slavonic or it's in Greek or it's in English, and we can't we can't understand it. We we need to have it in the language we can understand. Um, and that reminded me of that. But the the thing here is. Uh, the words of God, no matter what the language, will penetrate to the soul if the soul is receptive to it. That's so very true, Father Joseph. Thank you for that. Uh, I heard it in the life, but I, I never thought of that the people, this Hebrew was not their language, so they were listening to a liturgy in a foreign language. One of... Um... 
one of the fathers in Australia, he would say, you don't necessarily need to understand in your mind, uh, but understanding your soul and if, or in your heart, he used to point to his heart and he used to say, if you understand in here, then God will show you in, in your mind when you, when, you, when you're ready to understand. Yeah, and I, I think the point I'm making is that we shouldn't have contention over this. I mean, St. Basil does a, a great thing. He, he understands that people will have an easier time uh, hearing the word of the Lord and understanding it, and maybe having it enter their heart if they understand the words, which is why he does the translation. And we've seen many, many saints um, <clears throat> do this from that day down to, to the present. Um, St. Nicholas of Japan uh, translated in Japanese. Um, I forget who, uh, one of the, the, I think it was St. Stephen of Perm translated it into the, uh, the Lap language, I think it was. Um, just even St. Uh, Kirill and Basil translated into the Slavonic. Um, and of course, translation into English today. Um, when we hear a service in another language, we shouldn't get upset about it. What we should be doing is giving praise to God that it uh, is available in essentially all the languages of the world so that all people can come to God. And we should rejoice that people who don't understand Greek or Slavonic or English uh, can all come together uh, in the divine services. Something in this uh, in this life as well, I think St. Basil said it is impossible to enjoy both heavenly and earthly consolations since no man can serve two masters. I think what the saint is bringing out here is where our heart is set to. Um, the Lord talks about it where, where, um, uh, wherever our heart is, that's, um, that's what leads us. So if um, heavenly consolation is where your heart is, you won't re really be worried about all the things you're missing uh, in the present time. Uh, the people that are really um, could be sad in this life is the people that are losing things out of this present life, supposedly, um, for the love of God, but are not really um, seeking heavenly consolation, but rather um, a religious uh, a, a religious root um, that has nothing to do with faith in Christ, just uh, religiousness, I, I might say. We 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 read how Saint Basil and Ebulus they visited. Uh, L Libanius, and he offered them an elaborate, he set an elaborate meal before them, and but St. Basil and, and Ebulus didn't partake of anything besides bread and water at um, of this meal. And I'm wondering what lesson we should take from that, Vespita, because that seems like something we, should, we shouldn't just carelessly try to imitate. We should, first of all, um, be delicate um, with our host, uh, of course, these saints were great ascetics in everything. They weren't supposed ascetics like some of us pretend to be today. Uh, I wouldn't um, advise someone to totally ignore the fast, but um, I wouldn't advise them to be invited to someone's house and accept only bread and water. Those were... Um, extreme actions of the saints and perhaps they were to teach their host um, what the monastic life was like. That was their normal food. They were only eating bread and water. Uh, they weren't eating uh, other foods and then they come to this man and put on a show. So and that's I think specifically the thing that we keep in mind. Um, we also can talk to people, you know, if they're offering, uh, they're offering a food or something like that. Um, 
delicately indicate what we can and cannot eat. I do this with non-Orthodox relatives all the time. Um, and even if it, the, the feast is put before you, um, you can pick and choose what you're eating and the speci specifically the quantity um, to some extent to be delicate. St. Basil hid from the people of Cappadocia when they wanted him to be ordained a bishop. And I guess my question is, when, not only for, obviously for the for the episcopacy, but also for uh, the priesthood, the diaconate, being becoming a, a reader, a subdeacon, when is it when is it good to run to, to or to refuse ordination or tonsure? And when is it not? When when is it the right time to actually accept it? I would say the right time to accept it is when um, our spiritual fathers insist upon it, and that would be the right time uh, to present our spiritual desires. Um, it's not bad. Uh, they say that the the monastic life is taken upon, but the priesthood is gifted. In other words, um, you enter a monastery, so you decide, I'm going to become a, a monastic. The priesthood, however, for whether it's for a monastic or for a layman, um, is a gift that's um, awarded to someone that's willing to work in the vineyard of Christ. Um, no one gains it. No one should seek it directly. You know, hey, I want to be a priest, um, but should present themselves uh, to the church authorities and say, uh, I like the priesthood and that's, um, that will happen whenever you bless. I once witnessed um, the following. This was um, back in the 90s and I was visiting um, the Canadian diocese met with Metropolitan Vitali, and he was set to ordain a deacon as a priest because the church needed, the church where the deacon was serving needed a priest at that time. The old priest had died. And um, we're vested, we're, uh, the hours have begun, no deacon. And no deacon when the liturgy begins. And so we went through the liturgy without the deacon. And then later, uh, the deacon shows up and uh, Metropolitan Vitali asks him, well, what happened to you? And he said that um, as he was a, a coming, walking to church for the service, he was beset with very dark thoughts and he started trembling and he began to think, there's no way I can do this. So he ran away. It's the only time I've ever seen an ordination um, canceled for that reason. But uh, what Metropolitan Vitali said was, well, then clearly uh, he was not meant to be a priest. The Archbishop of Caesarea, Archbishop Eusebius, he, the life said that he was a virtuous, but I think a virtuous, but uneducated man. He would, but he, it said he was a virtuous man. But even despite being a virtuous man, he became jealous of St. Basil after hearing of all of St. Basil's praises. Um, not only was Archbishop Eusebius a virtuous man, he was also a defender of the church against Arianism. So if if someone like Archbishop Eusebius could fall into this jealousy, I'm, I'm wondering what lessons we should take from this. And I want to direct this question to Father Joseph. Um, so it's like, should we be careful in about even praising others in general, even if even if the person we're praising is not, if we're not praising that person directly, even praising them through a third party. Um, I'm just curious what lesson you take. The Lord teaches us, judge not lest you be judged. We always think about judging and condemning somebody. Oh, that's so and so, is, they're no good. But it's just as much judging by praising somebody and saying, oh, you're this and you're that and you're other. And what that ends up doing is stoking pride. Now, I think each of us can understand uh, what was going on with Eusebius. I mean, he knows he doesn't have the education, he doesn't have the, the talents that St. Basil has. 
and uh, so he succumbs to jealousy because the the enemy works on each of us, works more on deacons and priests, and, and specifically attacks bishops, and more specifically attacks bishops who are defending the faith. So it's it's not at all surprising that he uh, he succumbs to this. What's more important is that having succumbed to that uh, and being faced with having to combat Arians who are starting to make inroads into the church that is his diocese, uh, he knows it's beyond his ability to address all of that. He needs to get some help. And so he approaches St. Basil uh, and uh, repents of his jealousy and asks for St. Basil's help. Um, that's an important lesson for us. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that the minute we begin to think that we are somebody, we're already falling and that uh, we should neither seek praise nor give it, nor should we be seeking to uh, ferret out everybody else's faults and hiding our own. The response of St. Basil to Archbishop Eusebius' jealousy was to retire into the wilderness. Um, I'm wondering, Father, what you think about this as a strategy for us, if this is something we encounter. And even before that, though, like, how could we actually tell when someone really is jealous of us? Because it seems like a, 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 a convenient thing for a lie for a demon to tell you that someone is jealous of you. Well, I think that becomes evident from their actions and their words. And as far as St. Basil withdrawing, um, that makes makes sense. We're taught to to be peacemakers. He doesn't want to uh, engage in some kind of a polemic with the, the archbishop, whom he, he, he still respects him. Uh, and he knows the only way to resolve this is for one or the other of them to leave. And guess who's the bishop? That's the one who needs to stay. I also think it points out because um, Archbishop Sidious was a defender of the faith that the, the passions exist in true Orthodox, be, in true Orthodox, because sometimes we say, look, that man is true Orthodox, but he did this. Well, no, that doesn't mean that because we hold the faith that the passions don't exist. The passions are there more to find us. The enemy attacks those who are asleep, spiritually asleep. He attacks those who are struggling back. One more question from this life. We saw, we read about the the, the woman who was extorted by the, the government official. I guess he was a, some sort of tax collector. And she knew that the tax collector respected St. Basil. And so she went to St. Basil to ask for his intercession to to, to try to reason for his help with with the tax collector. And I'm wondering if this is a technique which is good for us to try to copy um, when we're, we're at some sort of odds with someone, find out who that person admires and go to that person to ask for their help. And maybe I want to direct this question to Desvulta. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with um, uh, someone interceding for us. Uh, it's happened many times. I've also been brought to court many times to defend people who I felt were being unjustly punished. So it's part of our life as a Christian. Back when I was first coming to the faith, someone told me that um, I should read the lives of the saints because that's theology in action. And that is so true. Um, I would encourage anyone and everyone to make a regular uh, habit of continuously reading the lives of saints or even coming back and rereading them from time to time. But we should be making sure that we are learning the lives of these saints so that uh, they give us insight when we face some of the same problems. While God's favorite, the great Basil, was serving the heavenly king in Cappadocia, the emperor Julian the Apostate, a blasphemer and cruel persecutor who boasted that he would annihilate the Christians, advanced with his army against the Persians. 
The saint gave himself over to prayer in church before the image of the most pure Theotokos, asking that God not allow the destroyer of Christians to survive. Beneath that icon was another of the great holy martyr Mercurius, depicted as a spear bearer. While Basil was praying, Saint Mercurius suddenly vanished from his icon. After a short time, he returned with his weapon dripping blood. In the interval, Julian was run through by the holy martyr, as in by Saint Mercurius, who was sent by the Immaculate Virgin Theotokos to slay God's enemy. Such was the gift of grace possessed by Saint Basil, that when he elevated the gifts during the liturgy, the dove holding the reserved mysteries shook thrice, indicating that the Spirit of God was descending. One day, however, the miracle failed to occur. Basil wondered what, what this might mean. Then he noticed a deacon holding a liturgical fan, exchanging glances with a woman standing in church. The saint ordered the man to leave the altar and imposed a penance on him. The deacon had to fast for seven days, during which time he was to spend the nights in prayer without any sleep. He was also required to distribute his, his possessions to the poor. After this, Saint Basil ordered that a that a partition hung with curtains be erected to separate altar from nave and to prevent women from looking into the sanctuary. Those who persist, persisted in gazing shamelessly at the celebrants he ordered to be deprived of Holy Communion and driven from church. In those days the Church of Christ was troubled by the Emperor Valens, who was blinded by Arianism. He drove many Orthodox hierarchs from their sees and replaced them with Arians. Other bishops, too weak and timorous to resist him, accepted the heresy. Basil, however, that unshakable pillar of the faith, fearlessly remained on his throne, strengthening and, ex and exhorting others to spurn Arianism as a false doctrine hateful to God. So doing, he infuriated the ruler. While travelling toward Antioch and oppressing the Orthodox in every province, Valens, Valens stopped in Caesarea with the intention of convincing Basil to join the Arian sect. He ordered his princes, nobles, and counsellors to employ promises and threats to persuade Basil to submit. The emperor's men vexed the saint relentlessly, and noble ladies enjoying the sovereign's favour sent their eunuchs to win over the saint, but in vain, for the great hierarch was steadfast in his convictions. Finally, the eparch Modestus summoned, summoned Basil. When it became clear that false promises would not lure the blessed one, the prefect began threatening him. If you take away my possessions, you will neither enrich yourself nor impoverish me, responded Basil. I doubt you will find much use for a few old garments or edifying books. Besides these, I own nothing. Exile does not frighten me, for the, for the whole world is God's and I consider myself at home wherever I may be. Torments I welcome as bringing me closer to my goal. I shall be glad if you torture me, because this will dispatch me more quickly to God. Modestus marvelled. No one has ever spoken to me so audaciously. Then it is clear you have not conversed before with a bishop, said the saint. In everything else we show humility and meekness, but when the matter, but when the matter pertains to God, we speak boldly. You, you have until morning to reconsider. If you remain unyielding, I will destroy you, threatened the eparch. Basil exclaimed, be certain to keep your promise. Tomorrow I shall repeat what I have said today. Modestus related everything to the emperor, whereupon Valens decided to leave the holy hierarch in peace. On the feast of Theophany, the emperor, wishing to make a show, show of favour to Basil, visited his church. Seeing its magnificence and the good order of the services, and hearing the chants and prayers of the faithful, Valens remarked that he had never witnessed such splendour in Arian churches. Basil instructed the ruler in heavenly truths, and Valens left feeling well disposed toward him. While he continued on to Antioch, however, evil counsellors slandered Basil to him, and he decided to exile the saint. As he sat down to sign the order, the table began to shake and his pen broke. The emperor split a second and a third quill. Then his hand started trembling. Fear overcame him, and acknowledging God's might, he tore up the page. Before long, the foes of piety resumed their intrigues, prevailing upon, upon Valens to dispatch an official named Anastasius to bring Basil to Antioch. When this man arrived in Caesarea and informed the, the saint of the emperor's command, Basil told him, Child, I have learned that not many days ago Valens, having heeded the advice of foolish men, broke three pens trying to sign an order exiling me. What advantage, what advantage is there for him in covering truth with darkness? 
inanimate objects split apart rather than serve as instruments of an unjust sentence. In Antioch, Basil stood before the eparch's judgment seat, and when asked why he would not accept the emperor's beliefs, replied, let it never be said that I abandoned the true Christian faith for the impious teachings of Arius. I follow the Father's doctrine regarding the consubstantiality of the persons of the Trinity, which I confess and glorify. The judge threatened Basil with death, but the saint said, I have long been ready to suffer for truth and to be freed from the body. I ask only that you keep your promise. The prefect informed the emperor that Basil did not fear threats, was unshakable in his convictions, and that his heart was steadfast. Valens threw into, flew into a rage and planned to destroy the Blessed One. Presently, word came that his son Galatus had, had fallen gravely ill and had, be, had, and had been given up for dead by the court physicians. The Empress appeared and berated her husband. Our child is dying because of your heretical beliefs and your persecution of God's holy bishop. Valens at once summoned Basil and demanded, Prove that your beliefs are pleasing to God by healing my son through prayer. If you convert to orthodoxy, your son will live, responded the saint. The emperor agreed to the condition, whereupon Basil prayed for the prince and he was healed. Valens thanked the Lord's favourite and let him return to his see. Learning this, the Arians were inflamed with envy and anger. They boasted, we could have done the same, and again deluded Valens. He gave him permission for them to baptise the boy, but the child died in the priest's arms as he was about to be plunged into the font. Anastasius, the official mentioned earlier, saw this with his own eyes and informed Valentinian, who was Valen's brother and ruler of the West, of, of what had happened. The Western emperor marvelled at the miracles, gave glory to God, and sent much gold to St. Basil through Anastasius. Upon receiving it, Basil built hospitals in his diocese and provided shelter for the needy. The Blessed Gregory of Nazianzus relates that later the Eparch Modestus, who had threatened the great hierarch, fell gravely ill. The prefect humbly begged Basil to, Basil to pray for him and was healed. Some time passed and Modestus was replaced as prefect by Eusebius, a kinsman of the emperor. In those days there lived in Caesarea a young, wealthy and very beautiful widow named Vestiana, the daughter of the senator Araxus. Eusebius was determined to force her to wed a certain high-ranking official. She, being chaste and unwilling to remarry, fled to the church and to God's holy hierarch Basil. Taking her under his protection, the saint refused to surrender her to the eparch's men. After they left, he sent her in secret to the convent where the venerable Macrina lived. Eusebius was infuriated and dispatched, and dispatched soldiers to remove the woman from the convent by force. When they failed to find her, he commanded them to search the saint's own dwelling. Being himself a shameless, immoral man, the prefect imagined that Basil was keeping the widow for sinful purposes in the cell where angels joined him in prayer. The eparch summoned Basil, abused him, and threatened to torture him if he did not reveal where he had hidden the woman. The holy Basil showed himself ready to face torment, saying, If you command my body to be raked with iron claws, you will actually do me a favour, for it will take my mind off the stomach pains that constantly afflict me. Meanwhile, the town folk, men and women alike, learned what was happening and ran to Eusebius's palace with swords and staves, intending to slay the prefect and rescue their holy father and pastor. Had Basil not calmed the people, they surely would have murdered the eparch. Frightened nearly out of his wits, Eusebius let Basil go unharmed. Heladius, a virtuous and holy man who served first as the great Basil's assistant, then as his successor and who witnessed his miracles, related the following. An orthodox senator named Praetorius, visiting the holy places, conceived the notion of dedicating his daughter to God as a nun. At the same time, the devil, the primordial hater of everything good, stirred up lust for the girl in the heart of one of the senator's slaves. The servant knew that the maiden was far above his reach, so he confessed his secret to a sorcerer, promising much gold in exchange for help in winning the girl's hand. At first, the sorcerer refused to become entangled in the matter, but was finally persuaded and said, if you wish, I will send you to my master, the devil. He will help you if you agree to carry out his instructions. The wretched servant prom promised, I will do whatever he commands. Are you ready to sign a document attesting that you renounce Christ? Asked the wizard. 
I am, if you give me what I want, the slave replied. In that case, I shall aid you, said the sorcerer, who wrote to the devil, since, O master, it is my duty to persuade men to abandon the Christian faith and bring them under your authority, thereby increasing the number of your subjects, I am sending you this youth. He is burning with lust for a maiden, and I beg you to make it possible for him to have her. If you do this, my fame will spread, and I will attract more worshippers to you. The magician gave the letter to the young man and told him, After dark, go to the pagan cemetery and hold this letter in the air. The devil's underlings will take you to their lord. The pathetic slave hurried to the cemetery to summon the demons. They quickly appeared and led the deluded man to their prince. Beholding Satan on a lofty throne, surrounded by myriads of dark villainous fiends, he presented the letter. The devil asked, Do you believe in me? I do, declared the young man. Do you renounce Christ? asked the devil. I do, avowed the servant. You Christians frequently come to me when you want help, complained Satan. But when you have what you desire, you betray me and return to Christ, who being kind and loving accepts you. I want you to write with your own hand a, de a declaration testifying that you disavow Christ and your baptism willingly, that you are mine forever, and that you, that you will endure everlasting torment with me. If you do this, I will grant your wish. The young man complied. The soul-destroying serpent at once dispatched demons of fornication which aroused in the maiden a longing for the youth so powerful that she collapsed and convulsing with spasms of lust, cried to her father, have pity on me, have pity on your only daughter, let me marry our servant with whom I have fallen hopelessly in love. If you refuse me, you will be the cause of my death and have to answer for me on the day of judgment. The father was horrified and lamented, woe is me a sinner. What has befallen you, daughter? Who has bewitched you, light, who has bewitched you, light of my eyes? I have hoped to betroth you to the heavenly bridegroom and see you join the company of angels, glorifying God in psalms and hymns. I look to you to be the guarantor of my salvation, but you shamelessly demand that I marry you to a slave. Do not demean yourself and send me down to Hades in grief, O child. The maiden paid no heed to her father, but insisted, If you reject my plea, I will kill myself. The father yielded to her entreaty and the advice of kindred and friends, rather than see her end as a suicide. Calling for the servant, he gave his consent to the unequal union and bestowed upon him great wealth. Then he summoned his daughter, saying, Come, shameless hussy, and make ready to take your place in the bed of this churl, but I think you will repent bitterly of your conduct. The diabolical wedding was performed, and shortly it was, shortly it was noticed by his servants that the groom was not attending church or receiving the holy mysteries. Surely you are aware, they told the bride, that your husband is no Christian but an apostate. Hearing this, she was overcome by grief, fell to the ground, ripped her face with her nails, and beat her breast unceasingly, crying, No one who disobeys his parents can be saved. How will I tell my father of this new disgrace? Woe is me, fallen into perdition. Why was I ever born? Her husband attempted to comfort her, saying that the accusations were slanderous. She took some consolation in his words and told him, If you wish to prove your innocence and dispel grief from my miserable soul, come with me to church tomorrow and receive the all-pure mysteries in my presence, then I will believe you. No longer able to conceal the truth, her husband explained that he had sold his salvation to the devil. At this she set aside feminine reticence and wisely hurried to the holy basil. Take pity on me, disciple of Christ, she cried. Take pity on one who disobeyed her father and surrendered herself to diabolical delusion. After she had related everything, Basil summoned her husband. He asked whether the story was true, and the young man weeping answered, Yes, hierarch of God, it surely is. Even if I remained silent, circumstances would proclaim the truth. The saint asked, Do you wish to return to our Lord Jesus Christ? More than anything else, the man admitted, but I cannot. Why is that? wondered Basil. Because I wrote a document in which I denied Christ and submitted to the devil, explained the man. Do not be troubled. God is the friend of man and accepts the repentant sinner, Basil assured him. The man's wife threw herself at the saint's feet and cried, Help us if you can, disciple of Christ. Do you believe that you can be saved? the saint asked the man. He exclaimed, I believe, Master. Help thou mine unbelief. 
the saint took him by the hand, made the sign of the cross over him, instructed him to pray unceasingly, and locked him in a room with, within the church compound. Meanwhile, Basil offered up entreaty on his behalf for three days, after which he visited the penitent and asked, How are you, child? I am in a most unfortunate state, master, the young man replied. I am terrified of the demons. They shoot arrows at me, throw rocks and scream. They hold up my declaration and shout, you came to us, not you came to us, not we to you. Giving him a little food, the saint traced the sign of the cross over the wretched man, then shut then shut him in again. A few days later he returned and inquired, How goes it, child? I hear threats and cries, but no longer see the fiends, answered the man. Basil gave him a little more food and asked and after praying for him, locked the door and departed. On the fortieth day he came back and asked, Child, how are things with you? They go well, Holy Father, the man said. I saw you in a dream doing battle for me and conquering the devil. St. Basil said a prayer, released him from confinement and took him to his cell. The next morning he summoned the clergy, the monks and the Christ-loving people and announced, Brethren, let us glorify God, the friend of man. Lo, the good shepherd wishes to take this lost sheep upon his shoulder and bear it into the church. Tonight we must entreat him to vanquish and put to shame the enemy of our souls. The faithful gathered in church and prayed all night for the penitent, crying, Lord have mercy. At dawn, Basil, escorted by the congregation chanting psalms and hymns, fetched the young man and led him to the church. Suddenly the devil began trying to pull the sufferer away from the saint. Saint of God, help me, the man exclaimed. So violently did the evil one pull his victim that Basil was afraid he might lose him. O shameless destroyer of souls, prince of darkness and perdition, thundered the bishop. Is it not enough for you to have brought about your own destruction and that of your minions? When will you stop persecuting this poor creation of my God? You disgust me, Basil, slavered Satan. The Lord banish you, devil, shouted the hierarch. The infernal spirit answered, you overstep your bounds, Basil. I did not, I did not approach this cur. He came to me. He eagerly renounced Christ, giving me this document, which I, will, which I will present to the great judge on the last day. Blessed be the Lord my God, exclaimed Basil. No devil that these people will not desist from prayer until you relinquish that paper. Then turning to the faithful, the saint commanded, raise your hands to heaven and cry, Lord have mercy. The believers lifted their hands and repeated, Lord have mercy, many times weeping. And behold, the document written by the young man escaped Satan's grasp and flew through the air into the hand of the Blessed One. Basil rejoiced greatly and thanked God, then asked the young man loudly so that all could hear, Do you recognize this, brother? The man replied, Yes, Bishop of God, I wrote it myself. At this the great Basil ripped it to pieces in the sight of all, led the devil's victim into the church, and imparted to him the divine mysteries. Afterwards, he ordered that a fine banquet be provided for the worshippers, then instructed the young man how to live piously and, return him, and returned him to his wife, glorifying the Lord and thanking him for his mercy. I think everyone should marvel at the power of repentance, no matter what we've done. If we want to, Christ will find a way to save us. Even if all the odds are against us, he will come and search for us and um, and save us. And this is the story with this man who signed the contract with the devil. Uh, Christ, uh, our God, is all-powerful, and uh, no one um, can stand up against him, not even the hordes of the demons. Vespera, what should we make of the fact that um, St. Basil prayed that Julian the Apostate would die in battle and that the Mother of God sent St. Mercurius to actually slay Julian the Apostate? Yes, uh, St. Basil prayed for the good of the people. As long as the denier of Christ was on the throne, it wasn't good for anyone. We also read how those who um, who gazed at the celebrants during divine liturgy were excommunicated and driven from the church. It was, um, I'm assuming it was only woman, but who knows? Um, well, was, was this only woman? And um, where should we be looking during divine services, Despotor, if we're 
if we're in the um, with the faithful. Well, now we have the icon screen that helps us, but um, the truth of the matter is that uh, we shouldn't be looking around in church, and we certainly shouldn't be looking around with desire. That was the very wrong thing in this case. I'm wondering if Your Grace has anything to comment on the fact that what St. Basil said about how a bishop shows humility and meekness in every matter except those pertaining to God where they speak with boldness. Yes, um, this is where the bishop should be bold and this is where he should be a lion and everything else he should be a lamb. Uh, doesn't always happen, but this is the way it should be. The the emperor came to Caesarea, Caesarea. I get confused about how to say it. I think in English it's Caesarea, but um, I'm what the so the emperor. I think he sent his eparch in to try to intimidate Saint Basil, and after threatening Saint Basil, um, well, Saint Basil didn't show any fear for him or anything that could possibly that the man could possibly do to him. He said, you know, if you torture me, this is good. If you kill me, this is good. This is a relief. If you take my things, that's, that's no big deal. If you send me anywhere, the whole, the whole world is my home. Um, and so the, they left him, they left St. Basil alone. And I'm wondering, it seems like there's a lesson there for us, um, but I don't really know what it is, but it seems to be like if we, was this just just complete dispassion that Basil had? And um, there's obviously a, like a freedom that comes with that if you really don't care about about where you put your head down, what where your next meal is going to come from, about inflictions that you might suffer in your body. Um, I don't know. You kind of I don't really know what to comment on this. I don't have a comment, but it stuck out to me, and I'm wondering what your grace has to say about it. Basil had totally surrendered to his savior. Um, something that we often don't do. We're not ready to surrender everything to Christ and that will be the answer. But St. Basil was, and like you said, it, it's a big comfort to know that no one can do anything to you because um, everything's uh, a gain for the, for the Christian. Whatever bad happens to us, is uh, a gain for us. It's it's a a positive thing. So I'm kind of I guess what I'm wondering is because all of us have moments in our life where we are experiencing something like this in intimidation, or it could be being bullied in the workplace, um, at school, wherever. And is this really the attitude that we should have? I'm I'm wondering if the emperor and his his goons left St. Basil alone because he showed no fear. And I wonder if this is something that not only humans do, but also the devil and the demons as well. Exactly. If we let the devil know that we're scared of him, then he continues to go on. Uh, some Christians are tortured um, by some thoughts and the more they appear scared by their thoughts because those thoughts are from the devil, the more he keeps going at the Christians. So it's good that when something comes from the devil, to just ignore it as someone that's powerless over us doing it. If, a, if an Orthodox Christian has a thought come into their head, which is just really, really awful, and they cringe at it, and they 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 might think like about you know how am I going to confess this? Um, how am I going to confess this? What should that person do? That's better if they if they have those kind of like just real like real, and we all have them as far as I understand. If they have those really just kind of blood chilling, I mean, that's too strong a word. But if they have these really bad thoughts, if a robber comes into our house and steals from us, we're really not responsible uh, because the robber came in and took what he wanted. However, and I'm talking about this as a spiritual analogy, however, if 
we invite the robber in and we make him sit down and we serve him dinner, then we are responsible for whatever he stole. So we should respond to the devil that um, I don't care what you're saying. It's not my words, it's yours. And just go away because um, uh, Christ will smite you. The one thing that I really amazed me is maybe amazed is too strong a word, but certainly stood out to me was that when this young man, the slave, went to the devil to ask for the devil's help with this um, to win to marry this woman, the devil flat out told him that if you 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 sign this document saying that you're going to go to hell with me to suffer for eternity. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have a thought on this other than uh, just to ask your grace if what your grace's thoughts, if your grace has anything to say about this. This is an extreme case. In most cases, the devil doesn't do something so drastic. He convinces us over to his side without us really signing a document. But we know that our choices uh, will bring us away from Christ. Uh, this is something we face every day, I think, of our life. Do I make this choice or do I make that choice? Uh, make the wrong choice and you're giving a victory to the devil. Uh, of course, we see that even if we've signed the way our soul like this man has done, uh, um, Christ will uh, accept our repentance if it's done correctly. So... Uh, Let's live repentance. Great Lent is almost upon us. It's the time of repentance itself. So I think that should be in front of us at all times, that this is the way to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we say that to be to never be scandalized belongs to the angels. To fall be belongs to men. Uh, to remain... Uh, in your fall is the work of the demons. So we want to be picking ourselves up every day. Every day we fall, every day we pick ourselves up again. The same Helladius, a most credible man, also told this story about St. Basil. One day our venerable father, illumined by divine grace, said to his clergy, come with me children and we shall see the glory of God and extol the master. They left the city without telling anyone where they were going. At that time, there lived a presbyter named Anastasius and his wife Theognia, who had been married for at least 40 years. They were still virgins, but most people thought that Theognia was barren. Anastasius was a holy man, a vessel of the spirit and clairvoyant. Foreseeing Basil's coming, he told Theognia, Sister, I am going, I am going to work in the fields, cl clean the house, and at the ninth hour, light the lamps. Then go out to meet the holy Archbishop Basil, for he is deigned to visit us sinners. Theognia was doubtful, but obeyed Anastasius. As Basil approached the house, Theognia greeted him and, and did him homage. Are you in good health, Lady Theognia? Basil asked. Startled to hear the man of God call her by, by name, she replied, I am holy master. Tell me, my lady, where is your brother Anastasius? asked the blessed one. Anastasius is not my brother, but my husband, she corrected him. He is in the fields. No, he is at home, asserted Basil. Sensing that Basil knew their secret, Theognia was overcome by fear and trembling. She fell at the saint's feet and exclaimed, Pray for me, a sinful woman, O hierarch of God. I perceive that great and marvellous things are in your power. The Lord's favourite sent up supplication for her, then entered the house. Anastasius, who who had indeed returned from his work, fell at Basil's feet and kissed them, crying, And whence is this to me, that the great hierarch of my Lord should come to me? I am glad to see you, disciple of Christ, said the bishop. Now to the church, let us celebrate the divine service. The, the presbyter had the custom of fasting every day except Saturday and Sunday, when he ate bread and drank water. Informed by heaven of this, Basil without hesitation commanded Anastasius to serve the liturgy. Anastasius protest, protested, Master, it says in the scriptures, the less is blessed of the better, but Basil insisted, to your good works add obedience. At the elevation of the dread mysteries, 
St. Basil and the others who were worthy saw the most holy spirit descend in the form of fire and surround Anastasius. After the dismissal, everyone returned to Anastasius's house to eat. During the meal, Basil said to him, tell me about your life. I know that you have a treasure here. Holy hierarch of God, I am a sinful man and pay taxes like everyone else, explained Anastasius. I have two yoke of oxen. I work with one and my hired helper with the other. What I earn from toiling with one pair, I spend on the relief of travelers. My gain from the other goes to pay taxes. My wife is a devoted helper, serving me in providing hospitality to strangers. Why do you call Theognia your wife when she is really your sister? Tell me about your virtues, insisted Basil. Anastasius replied, I have never done anything virtuous. Come with me, commanded the bishop, who went directly to a certain door in the house. Open it. Why do you want to see a closet filled with household goods, protested Anastasius. It was to, it was to see those goods that I came here, said Basil. The presbyter hesitated, so the saint commanded the door to open of its own accord. Inside, St. Basil found a man suffering from leprosy, whom no one knew about except the priest and his wife. Why did you try to hide this treasure from me, demanded Basil. He is a scoundrel, said the priest, abusive and quarrelsome. I did not want him to offend your holiness. You do well in serving him, said the blessed one. Let me attend to him tonight, that I, that I, may, share in your, that I may share your reward. Basil remained alone with the leper, keeping vigil till morning. At dawn he opened the door and the sufferer emerged, cleansed and whole. Anastasius, his wife, and the others glorified God. After conversing affectionately with the presbyter and instructing everyone in spiritual matters, the saint returned home. The holy desert dweller Ephraim the Syrian heard about Basil and begged God to reveal to him what sort of man the saint was. One day while in ecstasy, he beheld a, a fiery pillar reaching to heaven. From it a voice thundered, Ephraim, Ephraim, Basil is like a column of fire. Without delay, Ephraim set, set out for Caesarea, taking an interpreter, since he could not speak Greek. He arrived in the city at Theophany. From a distance, he caught sight of Basil, dressed in fine, bright robes and surrounded by his clergy, similarly arrayed. Sorely tempted by the sight, Ephraim remarked to the translator, Perhaps, brother, we have laboured to no purpose. I was not expecting such ostentation. Then, entering the church, St. Ephraim found himself a corner and said, In vain have we borne the burden and heat of the day. How can this man make such a display and still be a pillar of fire? While Ephraim was being troubled by a storm of thoughts, the Holy Spirit informed Basil of his presence. The great hierarch sent his archdeacon to fetch him, saying, Go to the western end of the church, where you will find a short, almost beardless monk standing in a corner with another man. Say to the monk, whose name is Ephraim, Come to the sanctuary. The archbishop wishes to speak with you. The archdeacon, pushing his way through the crowd with great difficulty, reached the venerable Ephraim and said to him, My lord, bless me. Come, the archbishop wishes to see you in the altar. The translator explained the message and Ephraim replied, You have the wrong man, brother. We have just arrived and the archbishop does not know me. The archdeacon returned to Basil, who was reading passages from holy books to the people. As the hierarch read, St. Ephraim saw fire issue from his mouth. Basil instructed the archdeacon, go back and tell the monk, my lord Ephraim, the archbishop requires your presence in the altar. The archdeacon did as commanded. Ephraim fell to his knees, glorified God and exclaimed, truly great is Basil. He is indeed a pillar of fire and the Holy Spirit speaks through him. Then he requested the archdeacon to ask Basil to receive him privately. At the conclusion of the service, the Holy Archbishop retired to the sacristy. When Ephraim entered, Basil kissed him, saying, Greetings, Father. It is well known that you, are, that you are busy increasing the number of Christ's disciples living in the wilderness and driving the demons out of the desert by the Lord's power. So why have you wearied yourself by coming here? What did you think to gain by making the acquaintance of such a sinner? But may God reward your labor, Father. Ephraim told Basil everything that was in his heart and with his companion received the most pure mysteries at the saint's hands. Afterwards, while they were eating at the archiepiscopal residence, Ephraim said to Saint Basil, Most Holy Father, I would like to request a favour. Stay on, Basil answered. I am your debtor, for you have put yourself through much trouble taking such a long journey. Ephraim continued, Father, it is no secret that God grants whatever you ask, 
beseech him to enable me to speak Greek. Basil replied, Your request is beyond my power, but since you ask with steadfast trust in the Lord, let us go to his temple. Let us go to his temple, O reverend father and teacher of ascetics, and beg him to grant your desire. It is written that nothing is impossible for him. The will of them that fear him shall he do, and their supplication shall he hear, and he shall save them, say the scriptures. They retired to the church and prayed fervently. Then the great Basil asked, Why, my Lord Ephraim, do you not accept ordination? You deserve to be a presbyter. Because of my sins, master, answered Ephraim. Oh, if only I had your sins, Basil cried. Let us prostrate ourselves before the Lord. As Ephraim lay on the floor, St. Basil placed his hands upon the godly one's head and recited the prayer for the ordination of a deacon. Then he said to Ephraim, Give the command that we rise. At that moment, the newly ordained deacon received knowledge of Greek, and he proclaimed in that tongue, Save us, help us, raise us up and preserve us, O God, by thy grace. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the stammerers shall speak plainly. Everyone glorified God, who had given Ephraim knowledge of a language he could previously neither speak nor understand. The venerable Ephraim, full of spiritual joy, remained three days with St. Basil, who ordained him presbyter and his interpreter deacon, then permitted him to depart, to depart in peace. I think this, um, this part of the life of St. Basil is um, known to most of us, that, um, and it's a good reason that no one should be scandalized, which sometimes lay people are especially um greeks with a communist um mindset no one should be um scandalized by beautiful vestments because these are for the glory of god saint basil was a great ascetic but when he served liturgy he he dressed in um very nice garments and the priest like was so whatever is for the glory of God is not a reason for us to be scandalized. It's only for the glory of God. Uh, what do we make this St. Ephraim, when he asked Basil to pray that um, St. Ephraim could speak Greek, St. Basil didn't suggest to pray there and then where they were eating. He instead said, let's, let's go into the church. And that's that's where they went. They went to the church and made their request. That's where they made they made their prayers. And I guess afterwards, Saint Basil. <laughs> I don't know if he tricked Saint Ephraim into uh, into prostrating so that he could then ordain him as a deacon on the spot. Um, but I I didn't know what to make of that. This bit of that Saint Basil said, "Let's go into the church to make this request," and that's what they did. And uh, Ephraim knew that. Um... St. Basil could um, perform the miracle to give him the knowledge of the Greek language. Uh, but he hit a wall with St. Basil's humility, who wanted uh, the miracle to be worked in the church. So it wouldn't appear that St. Basil was the one who performed the, the great miracle of her, her him, of uh, he, uh, Saint from being granted the knowledge of uh, the Greek language. Uh, so, yes, and it, it does sound like you tricked him into, but this is uh, things of God, and for sure St. Basil knew that this had to happen. While the wicked Emperor Valens was in Nicaea, prominent Arians approached him requesting that he drive the Orthodox from the cathedral and give it to them. The ruler, himself a heretic, forcibly removed the faithful and allowed the dissenters to occupy the building, after which he left for the imperial city. The entire community of the Orthodox, which was of considerable size, was grief-stricken. While matters were in this state, the great helper and protector of all the churches, St. Basil, arrived in Nicaea. Weeping and lamenting, the flock, of, the flock of true believers informed him of what the emperor had done. The Blessed One comforted them and hurried to Constantinople, where he presented himself to Valens and said, "'It is written, it is written, the king's honor loveth judgment, and wisdom tells us that the king's judgment is righteous. Why then, O emperor, have you pronounced an unjust sentence, expelling the orthodox from their holy church and giving it to misbelievers? The emperor replied, Have you come to insult me, Basil? 
it does not behoove you to speak thus. It would certainly behoove me to die for the truth, retorted Basil. The chief, the chief cook of the palace, whose name was Demosthenes, was standing nearby, and wishing to abet the Arian cause, inter interjected and crudely reviled the saint. Behold, laughed Basil, a new Demosthenes, this one an illiterate. The humiliated cook muttered something to which the Blessed One responded, Your business is pots and pans, not the dogmas of the church. Furious with Basil, but knowing that he had acted wrongly, the emperor commanded, Return to Nicaea and judge between the factions, but do not show favoritism to your party. If I judge wrongly, send me to prison, expel my co-believers and give the church to the Arians, said the man of God. Basil went back to Nicaea with an imperial decree, assembled the Arians and announced, the emperor has given me authority to decide whether you or the Orthodox should have the church you took by force. The Arians replied, judge then, but as the emperor would. Come Arians, come Arians and Orthodox, exclaimed Basil, we will lock the church. Both sides will affix their seals and set strong guards of men they trust. Then pray for three days and nights, you, you Arians, and return. If you can open the doors by your supplications, the church will be yours in perpetuity. If you cannot, we shall pray for a single night and go to the church, chanting a litia. We shall have permanent control of the building if the doors open for us. Otherwise, it will be yours again. This proposal pleased the Arians, but the Orthodox were vexed with the saint, protesting that he, that he gave the heretics an unfair advantage out of fear of the emperor. Nevertheless, both sides agreed, locked the church, sealed it, and set guards. The Arians prayed for three days and nights, but their prayers achieved nothing. So they continued to entreat God's mercy until noon of the fourth day, crying, Lord, have mercy. When the doors failed to open, they dispersed, hanging their heads in shame. Meanwhile, the great Basil assembled the Orthodox, men, women, and children, and led, and led them to the church of the holy martyr, the Omides, outside of the city. He celebrated an all-night vigil there, then proceeded with the crowd to the cathedral, chanting, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Halting before the portals, he commanded the people, Raise your hands to heaven and cry with heart, heartfelt ardor, Lord, have mercy. After they had prayed, the saint ordered that there be silence. He made the sign of the cross over the doors thrice and shouted, Blessed is the God of the Christians, always now and ever and unto the ages of ages. The people answered, Amen. Suddenly the earth quaked, the locks broke apart, the bars fell to the floor, the seal split, and the doors flew open, slamming against the wall as though a mighty wind were blowing or a fierce tempest raging chanting, lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall enter. Basil hurried into the building with the whole congregation of the Orthodox. After celebrating the divine service, he joyfully dismissed the faithful. Many Arians, who had returned in great numbers to see how matters would end, renounced impiety and joined themselves to the true believers. When the emperor learned of Basil's judicious handling of affairs and the glorious miracle, he marveled greatly and denounced vile Arianism. Nevertheless, blinded by malice, he did not turn to orthodoxy. Later he perished miserably. Defeated and wounded in, in a battle in Thrace, he fled and cowered in a barn full of straw. His pursuers surrounded the building and set it on fire. The emperor was burned alive and his soul departed to everlasting flames. The tyrant's demise took place after the death of our holy father Basil, but in the same year. Slanderers came to the saint accusing his brother Peter, Bishop of Sebastia, of continuing to enjoy the pleasures of marriage with his wife, from whom he was required to separate at his consecration. Basil told them, you have done well to inform me of this. Come, we shall denounce Peter to his face. The Holy Spirit, who dwelt in Peter's heart, for he was a chaste man and lived with his wife as though she were his sister, informed him that Basil was approaching. He went out five miles from Sebastia to meet the Blessed One. When he saw his brother accompanied by a large crowd, he smiled and said, Brother, how is it that you have come out against me as, as against a thief? The bishops exchanged a kiss in the Lord, entered the city, prayed at the church of the Holy Forty Martyrs, and proceeded to the Episcopal residence. Basil greeted his sister-in-law, Hail, sister, or better to say, Bride of the Lord, I have come to see you. Hail, most, most honourable father, she replied. I have long wished to kiss your venerable feet. 
Then Basil turned to Peter and said, Brother, I would like you and your wife to spend the night with me in church. Whatever you wish, Peter replied. Night fell, and Peter and his wife went to the church, where Basil was waiting with five virtuous men. In the middle of the night, the saint roused the men from sleep and asked, What do you see above my sister-in-law and brother? God's angels are fanning them and anointing their undefiled bed with fragrant oil, they, they replied. Tell no one the vision, Basil instructed them. At dawn, Basil commanded the people to assemble in church and had a brazier full of hot coals, coals brought. Lift up your apron, he instructed his sister-in-law. Then he ordered the servants, put then he ordered the servants, put the coals on it. Next he requested that more live coals be brought, told his brother to hold out his felonion, and bade the servants pour the coals onto the vestment. The holy couple held their embers for a long time, but neither apron nor felonion was singed. In astonishment the congregation exclaimed, The Lord preserves his saints and blesses them upon the earth. Finally, Peter and his wife dropped the embers on the floor. No smell of smoke clung, clung to them. Presently, Basil told the five men who had spent the night in the church to reveal what they had seen. They related the vision and everyone glorified God, who makes evident the falsity of slander against his saints. In Caesarea, there lived a very wealthy wid widow of distinguished lineage. She was, however, a voluptuary and cared for nothing but the gratification of the flesh, being altogether enslaved to sin. For many years she indulged in fornication, but God, who desires that all repent, touched her heart with grace. She began to regret wasting her life, and one day while she was alone, pondering her countless sins, tears welled in her eyes. Woe is me, the accursed, she lamented. How shall I justify my innumerable transgressions before the righteous judge? I have defiled both soul and body. Woe is me, the most despicable of women. Who else has sunk to such a depth of iniquity? Neither the harlot nor the publican sinned as I. Worst of all, I have sullied myself before beyond measure after baptism. Who knows if God will accept my repentance? The woman reviewed everything she had done since her youth. She wrote all her sins on a sheet of parchment, concluding with the most serious one, then rolled up the document and sealed it. Stopping St. Basil as he was about to enter church, she cast herself at his feet and cried, Take pity on me, hierarch of God. I am the greatest of sinners. The saint inquired what she wanted him to do for her, and she presented the sealed confession, saying, Master, I have recorded all my transgressions on this sheet of parchment. Do not break the seal or read it, favourite of the Lord, but cleanse it by your entreaties. I have faith that he who moved me to repent will hear you. Basil took the scroll, lifted his eyes to heaven and prayed, For thee, O Lord, all things are possible. Thou didst take upon thyself the whole, word, the whole world's iniquity and canst easily cleanse the sins of this one soul. Albeit thou dost record our every offence, thy mercy is infinite and inscrutable. With this he entered the church and prostrated himself before the holy table. The Blessed One spent the entire night interceding for the sinner. The next morning, after celebrating the divine service, he summoned the woman and returned the scroll unopened. Have you heard the saying, who can forgive sins but God only, he asked. I have, Reverend Father, and am confident that by your prayers he will pardon my trespasses, she answered. With these words, the woman unrolled the sheet and found that all her sins had been effaced, except the most grievous one. Beating her breast, she fell at the saint's feet, crying, have mercy on me, servant of, of God most high. You prayed the good Lord to the good Lord to remit my offences, and he forgave all but one. Now beseech him to absolve this last one also. Shedding tears of compassion, the archbishop said, Rise, woman, I myself am a sinner in need of forgiveness. He who cleansed your other sins can wash away the one that remains. If in the future you refrain from committing wicked deeds and begin to walk in the way of the Lord, you will not only be pardoned, but will even be counted worthy of heaven's glory. Here is my advice. Go to the holy man Ephraim, give him your scroll, and beg him to entreat God, who loves mankind, to have mercy on you. The woman found the blessed Ephraim's cell, the blessed Ephraim's cell deep in the desert. Knocking on the door, she called, Venerable Father, help me a sinner. By the Holy Spirit, Ephraim knew why she had come and replied, Depart, woman, I myself am a sinner in need of assistance. At this she threw the scroll to the ground and announced, Archbishop Basil sent me here. 
except for one, all my sins have been cleansed by his intercessions. He told me to beseech you to pray that the last one be remitted. Do not reject me, for I have come from far away for no other purpose than this. Child, go back to Basil, counseled the godly Ephraim. If he obtained forgiveness of your other sins, he is certainly able to secure pardon of the one remaining. Only make haste so that you find so that you find him among the living, for he is soon to depart unto the Lord. The woman bowed before the venerable one and hurried back to Caesarea. She arrived there to meet the holy Basil's funeral procession. Casting herself to the ground, she lamented pitifully and cried to the saint as though he was still alive. Woe is me, O hierarch of God! Woe is me, the wretch! Why did you send me into the wilderness? Was it because you wished to depart the body undisturbed? In vain did I wander through the desert. God sees and will judge between us. He knows that having power to help me, you sent me off to chase down another to no good purpose. So saying, the woman threw the scroll onto the bier and explained to the people what had happened. While she was be bemoaning her misfortune, a clergyman opened the scroll and finding it blank, told the woman, in vain do you grieve, not understanding how great is God's love for man or how wondrous his mercy to you. See, there is nothing written here. Everyone rejoiced and glorified the Lord who had given his servant power to work miracles after his death. In Caesarea there lived a Jew named Joseph. So knowledgeable was he in the science of medicine that by observing the flow of blood through a sick person's veins, he could predict the hour of death three to five days beforehand. Our God-bearing father Basil, foreseeing the Jews' conver conversion to Christ, loved him greatly. He frequently invited Joseph to visit him, attempting to persuade him to abandon the Hebrew law and accept holy baptism. Joseph refused to convert, saying, I wish to die in the faith into which I was born. To this the saint replied, Believe me, neither you nor I will die until you have been born of water and of the Spirit. Without the grace of baptism, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. Were not your fathers baptized in the cloud and the sea? Did they not drink of the rock which prefigured Christ, the spiritual rock, born of the Virgin for our salvation? They crucified the Lord, but he rose from the grave on the third day and ascended into heaven, where he sits on the right hand of the Father, and whence he will, des and whence he will descend to judge the living and the dead. The man of God said many such things to benefit the Jew's soul, but the infidel remained in his unbelief. When the time approached for the saint to depart this life and join God in heaven, he summoned the Jew. Pretending to, to want medical assistance from him, he asked, What do you think, Joseph? The Jew examined St. Basil and said to the servants, Make ready for a burial. Death will come at any moment. Basil protested, Not so, Joseph. Believe me, master, you will not last till sunset, insisted the Jew. What if I were to survive until noon tomorrow? asked the bishop. The Jew answered, let me die if you remain alive that long. You would do well to die, you would do well to die to sin and live for God, exclaimed the blessed one. I understand well what you are referring to, said the Jew, and I swear that if you live until dawn, you will have your wish. Our divine father entreated God to prolong his life till morning for the salvation of the Jew's soul, and the Lord granted his request. At daybreak, Basil sent for the physician. Joseph would not believe that Basil was still among the living, but went to the archiepiscopal residence anyhow, intending to examine the corpse. The Jew was astonished to find the saint alive. He fell prostrate and exclaimed from the bottom of his heart, Great is the God of the Christians. There is none other than he. I renounce Judaism, which is hateful to God, and convert to the, to the true Christian faith. Issue the command, Holy Father, that I be baptized at once with my entire household. I will baptize you myself, said St. Basil. The Jew felt Basil's right hand and said, Your strength is gone, Master, and you are too weak. It is impossible for you to baptize me. Everything is possible for the Creator, insisted the Blessed One. He rose, went to church, and baptized the Jew and his family in the presence of a large congregation. He gave Joseph the name John, served the liturgy, and imparted the divine body and blood to him. The Holy Hierarch remained in church until the ninth hour, instructing the newly baptized at length in the mysteries of eternal life and addressing a final discourse to his rational sheep. Then having exchanged a last kiss with everyone and forgiven all, 
he thanked God for the ineffable blessings he had enjoyed throughout his lifetime and surrendered his soul into the hands of the Lord. The newly baptized Jew, seeing the saint breathe his last, fell to the floor and sobbed, Truly, O Basil, servant of God, you would still be alive even now had you desired to remain in, the, in this world. It was on the 1st of January during the 15th and last year of Valen's reign, and during Gratian's fourth year as ruler, that the great archbishop and eloquent proclaimer of the gospel joined the holy hierarchs and eminent preachers of truth dwelling in heaven. The holy Basil was 45 years old when he departed this life. He shepherded the church of God for eight years, six months, and 16 days in all. St. Gregory of Nazianza received word of his friend's death and hastened to Caesarea to take part in the funeral, at which he shed copious tears. Other bishops assembled, joining the, theolo joining the theologian in chanting the funeral service in the church of the holy martyr Epsychius. At its conclusion, they buried the precious remains of heaven's great favourite Basil, praise praising God, who is one in Trinity. To him be glory unto the ages. Amen. Basil as a man of God, and I could say the man of God. Uh, he was saving people until his very last hour, and he even saved this Jew, um, which just goes to show us that uh, if we're light enough, then we can save anyone around us. I, I had a question about... Um... Emperor Valence, I think, uh, at the start of, or at the start of today, um, I think you read that Emperor Valence, or it was when the Arians were fighting over possession of the 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 church, I think it was. Um, what, Emperor Valence was he? an orthodox emperor or was he just the emperor of the area at the time it sounded like he was the emperor of constantinople uh put simply i didn't say basil go to constantinople to to ask him to to liberate the church from the the Aryan heretics that had taken it over um it sounded like even during um saint basil's time which probably wasn't too long after saint basil um saint constantine the great that uh, there were Arians or Arian sympathizers on the throne in Constantinople, but a Vespita would be the one to comment more precisely on that. Yes, that would have been the emperor of Constantinople. Um, the the heresy of the Arians shook the church for for many years. We know that St. Basil was a good friend of St. Gregory the Theologian, and sometimes we're made fun of for a lack of um, beautiful temples which um okay we are poor we are few but that means nothing when saint gregory the theologian was um elected patriarch of constantinople um the arians had took everything there wasn't even a single church for him to serve in when he arrived in constantinople uh, so uh, he served at the house of one of his cousins uh, a pious woman. Uh, so yes, uh, Arianism was um, a big problem. And yes, oftentimes the emperor of Constantinople of, uh, was, um, of Byzantium was uh, uh, an Arian in his beliefs or a supporter of the Arians. What precipitated my question about Emperor Valence was by um when so when a, a ecumenical council was called by an emperor i understand um the emperor is would not necessarily be orthodox so or or would would the emperor have to be of a, a true orthodox to actually call an ecumenical council or was that not the case who would call the council because he was the the one in power um, but that doesn't mean, of course, that the council would um, give the answer that the emperor would have liked to hear. But he he was the one to call the council in order to bring priest to, peace to the empire. So, yes, um, uh, some of the ecumenical councils were, were called by saintly people like um, uh, St. Constantine, the great and others were 
were called by people who were not um, of correct faith. I have a question. Um, I didn't hear everything that was said. We tuned in late, but it seemed like there was a woman who needed sins forgiving and St. Basil sent her to someone in the desert to forgive this other sin. And um, I've always been under the impression that when we confessed our sins, we were absolved and our sins are forgiving right there in the confessional. So could, could you help clear up my confusion, please? Um, first of all, if you heard all the story, the woman didn't actually confess. She had them written on a paper because she was totally unable to confess them. That's one thing. And uh, our sins are forgiven as soon as we confess, but um, we need uh, the remission that comes with forgiveness. In other words, um, it's like a penance. Uh, someone uh, we confess our sins, and the confessor might say, um, do um, uh, 500 prostrations. Uh, the, the committing of 500 prostrations would be part of the remission of those sins. So St. Basil of the Great, in order not to show his own holiness, but to try and show the holiness of other men, sends this woman with the one sin that still is appearing on her paper, all the other sins had been blotted out um, just by St. Basil praying about it. They had disappeared from the paper. He sends her to St. Ephraim in the desert, um, trying to show him as more holy, whereas St. Ephraim also didn't accept that he was the more holy and sends her back um, to St. Basil the Great. So. What's going on is that one saint is glorifying another and neither one wanting to accept the, the miracle as something they worked. There's also something about this, the woman though, that's where it seems like it's a real, um, she's bemoaning St. Basil at the end and kind of, she's criticizing him, but really to me, it's so she, she's living a life full of sin, it, it says, and but she comes to her senses, the Lord enlightens her and the first thing she does is she makes a list of all of the sins that she's committed and then it's like all of her energy from that point on or at least from this the point of the lord enlightening her about her way of life she all of her energy is committed to the to the forgiving of these sins and so she takes this list to saint basil and she she falls down at his, at his feet and begs him you know please have these sins um forgiven for me and then St. Basil gives her an obedience, which I'm sure was not easy, which was to, to venture out into the desert where St. Ephraim the Syrian was living and to, uh, to beg St. Ephraim the Syrian's help, which she did. And then St. Ephraim said, no, like, uh, go, go back to St. Basil. So you think, to me at least, I'm imagining how, you know, how frustrating, how much work this would have been for just for a woman. And besides this it also described that the, the woman was probably living a very uh a cushy a lifestyle so for her to be venturing out like into the desert i don't know if she was by herself or if she had protectors or whatever but this would have been very very difficult for her and then she comes back to saint basil and so what's the reward of all of her labors is that it's the forgiveness of her sins but i guess i'm wondering if your grace has any comments or any thoughts to share on this Yes, this case, and, and it appears again with a woman, at least one or twice more in in spiritual works. Uh, this woman, it seems, couldn't bring herself to say the sins. So she wrote the sins, and she didn't even want St. Basil to read them, um, which would not be acceptable for us today, I'm sure. But um, uh, St. Basil was... Um, was someone in total communion with God. And so her sins were forgiven, but um, the saint saw it fit that she should um, do a strange penance. In other words, you come here, I'm going to send you there. Uh, saint Ephraim is going to send you back, which I'm, I know Saint Basil knew. And in all of this, um, uh, this um, struggle, 
you're going to be forgiven.